guys, and welcome back to another episode of Federico Talks Watches. Unfortunately, I don't have Christian with me in this episode. That was supposed to be released two days ago, but my video card got corrupted. What a shame. It was really, really frustrating, um, and, you know, I didn't have time to shoot another video, which explains why there hasn't been anything released for a couple of days. I'm not a technology guy anyway. I prefer uh, wristwatches, you know, old school. So before we get started, I figured uh, we'd do a wristwatch check. What am I wearing? Today I'm wearing the vintage Omega Chrono Stop single push piece chronograph limited edition to the Italian market. Uh, you know, a really interesting little piece. And, you know, most vintage watches don't have great bracelets, but this one does. So I'm pretty happy about that. Perfect for summertime. So what are we talking about today? Well, today, I wanted to discuss a subject that I think there's a little bit of confusion about. A lot of people have been talking about this on the Facebook group, and even in my own comments. And that is, watch accuracy. You know, how accurate is your watch? What makes a watch accurate? And, you know, why does a $100 Seiko sometimes run more accurately than a watch that's a couple of thousand dollars with an out of movement? And the thing is, there's a few reasons for that, and I figured we'd get into it in this episode, and hopefully you guys find it useful. So there's a few factors that determine the accuracy of a watch. One of the factors is manufacturing tolerances, but that is pretty obvious. You know, some watches are just, you know, manufactured to have tighter, more accurate tolerances, and th these tend to be the more expensive pieces. So, manufacturing tolerances aside, what makes a watch accurate? You know, what decides if it's running at 2 seconds a day or at 10 seconds a day? One of the main factors is regulation. Now, regulation is um, done right before the watch leaves the factory to the end consumer or retailer. And that is, you know, essentially a process where the watchmaker regulates the movement to run within certain parameters. Now, most movements can be regulated. One of the few that can't, for example, is the movement in my um, System 51, which is hermetically sealed and doesn't you know, have any regulation options. But it was still regulated before it was sent out. It just can't be re-regulated. So regulating a movement is basically changing little tiny things inside the movement to change the beat of the watch. Now the most obvious one is something called the regulator, and I'll put a picture right up here. You know, a lot of these guys, uh, the easiest way to regulate a watch is just by changing the regulator, and this is how a lot of home watch enthusiasts do it themselves. And most watches do come with a regulator. However, there are a ton of other ways to regulate a watch, and this is what separates an expense, well, what separates most expensive watches from inexpensive watches. Inexpensive watches tend to have less points of regulations or less things that one can change to regulate the watch, meaning it'll never usually be as accurate. For example, on a Rolex movement, apart from the regulator, on the balance, there's something called microstella screws. I'll put a picture up of that as well. Now, microstella screws are little screws that screw into the balance. They're very, very small. And to regulate the beat of the watch, a watchmaker can screw them in or out. Therefore, depending on how the weight is distributed, the balance will oscillate differently. This can change the accuracy of a watch. Another way is the length of the mainspring. By making the mainspring longer or shorter, one can change these tolerances, and once again, a watch can run faster or slower. Now, as I said, the more sophisticated the movement, it tends to have more regulation points. But, for example, a typical Seiko, like a Seiko 5, it has a regulator, but it doesn't have microstella screws, for example. Or it's regulated by machine and not regulated by hand. Regulation is also something that takes a long time. You know, a watchmaker will regulate something, let's say the balance for this example, and then he'll test the watch for 24 hours. How's it working? Okay, it's working pretty well. Then he'll regulate something else, test that for 24 hours. And all these factors in tandem will determine how accurate a watch is. 
Also, another thing that you may have noticed is some watches say adjusted to five positions, adjusted to two positions. This means it's not only regulated in one position because the watch, since it's mechanical, depending how it you know, lays the forces of gravity, uh, what position it's in, can tell time differently. If you leave your watch dial side up overnight, it could tell time you know, much less accurately than if you leave it dial, si uh, dial side down. Now this is just an example, it's not, it's not literal. So what a lot of the higher end and more expensive watches do, uh, because it costs a lot more, is these watchmakers will regulate it before it leaves the factory in more than one position. You know, they'll regulate it dial side up, dial side down, sideways, crown side down, and make sure that it's running accurately in all these positions. Furthermore, you can go to the expense of getting a COSC certification, which means your watch is running between minus four and plus six seconds a day. This is an incredibly high tolerance. To give you an idea, to run within spec in a Seiko, it's you know, plus or minus around 20 a day. And even not in Seiko, in other high-end brands, for example, in Piaget, it's considered to be running within spec, you know, plus or minus about 10 a day. So, you know, somebody said the other day to me, Federico, you know, I've got the Seiko 5, it's running, you know, plus two seconds a day, which by the way is great, and I've got this other ETA-based watch, which is much more expensive, and the ETA movement is a lot more, uh, you know, prestigious, but it's running plus five seconds a day. Federico, what's going on? Well, the truth is, a lot of times, it's luck of the draw. You know, as long as it's running within the tolerance specified by the brand, then it's all gravy, so to speak. Now, Seiko's tolerances are a lot wider, so just because your watch is running plus two, that just means you got lucky. You could buy 10 of the same watches, one might be plus two, minus eight, plus 14, because it wasn't regulated very well. You know, it just means the tolerances are a lot wider and you got lucky with your particular watch. But if you buy this, you know, 10 of these ETA watches, the tolerances will be a lot tighter. You know, minus two, minus three, plus five, plus four, minus one. As you can see, they're a lot, you know, a lot closer to each other, so you're more likely to get a watch that, um, that, that is more accurate, so to speak. So the movements in themselves all have pretty much the same capacity for timekeeping. It just comes down to regulation. You know, how carefully was the watch regulated and how many positions was it regulated and in how many different ways was it regulated. Now, to the gentleman who had the Seiko that was running excellently, good for you, that's fantastic. However, um, you know, don't put down a Rolex or an ETA because trust me, when that Seiko needs to be re-regulated and it goes in for service, chances are it probably won't be running plus two anymore. Um, but once again, it's always nice to get an inexpensive watch that tells time very well. It's just not particularly common. So guys, I hope you found this discussion useful and thank you for sticking around for another episode of Federico Talks Watches. Please don't forget to follow me on Instagram, link in the description below, and don't forget to give me a thumbs up. It really does help, guys. Motivation is a big key factor for me doing these videos, and don't forget to subscribe. I'm finally back. I know there was a, you know four days with no content. I really, really apologize for that, but barring any future technical difficulties, I don't foresee that happening uh, in the near future, knock on wood. Anyway, guys, thank you so much, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.